This video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. Welcome to Electrified, it's your host Dylan Loomis. So today we're gonna try something different when it comes to me being on camera, going with this smaller version in the bottom corner. Maybe tomorrow we'll try one with no video. This is all based on some comments that I've read from you guys saying you might prefer it if I wasn't in the video. So please let me know what your preference is. Just comment video, small video, or no video with regard to me actually being on camera. I'll most likely just go with what the majority prefers. And to do that, I have to know what you guys actually think so please let me know. First up today Panasonic Holdings is considering building a new battery plant in the US to supply Tesla. Now we already knew this but we do get some new information. Panasonic plans to produce a new type of high capacity battery and aims to start operations as early as fiscal year 2024. Several sites are being considered Oklahoma which is close to Giga Texas. Panasonic also plans to operate this new plant independently. So this will be different than the operations at Giga Nevada as that is more of a partnership between Panasonic and Tesla. This new factory will be wholly run by Panasonic, but mostly, at least to start, to supply Tesla with 4680s. Here's something new. The decision on whether to build the plant will be based on the profitability of these new 4680 batteries that Panasonic is going to start producing in Japan starting in 2023. We already know that Panasonic has been testing these new 4680s for some time now, but until it can get to a level of volume production, it's not going to have a good enough idea on what the profitability of these new 4680s actually looks like. With these new batteries, Panasonic is looking to supply the Cybertruck and Tesla's next lineup of vehicles, including the Semi and most likely the Roadster. Speaking of Giga Nevada, we finally get an update on the estimated output per year, sitting at 39 gigawatt hours per year. Now, honestly, I think most of us expected this figure to be pushing 75 gigawatt hours by now, but from everything I can pick up on, it seems like getting talent out to Giga Nevada in the desert might be a bit of a challenge, so it could be better to expand elsewhere. And in particular, at Giga Austin and closer to Giga Austin. And at this hypothetical new plant, Panasonic said it will consider selling to other EV makers in the future, not just Tesla. Here we have data from Lynn Alden's most recent newsletter titled Inflation or Recession, effectively two scenarios our American economy is staring down at the moment. This part is more specific to Tesla, however. Supply chains have been disrupted in numerous ways from lockdowns, wars, shifts in demand, more at-home work, etc. Additionally, large portions of the commodity complex have been underinvested in during the past several years and continue to be underinvested in. And this chart makes it super clear. The commodity capex or capital expenditures as a percent of GDP. Starting in 2016, that rate has dropped pretty significantly from around three to 4% down to closer to one to 2%. And so it's this lack of spending in the commodity space that's now resulting in today's shortages. But why did this happen? With low interest rates, new technology, and plenty of appetite to deploy capital into the space, regardless of profitability, we had more oil than we knew what to do with for a while, and that helped keep prices low. We also had abundant supply of many other commodities during the 2010s, resulting in low prices and thus low incentive to find and develop more mines. This type of commodity cycle happened every couple decades or so. And now, due to years of low investment in commodities, the world is no longer oversupplied on many of those commodities like oil, gas, copper, and nickel. And a theme we talk about fairly often here on Electrified, supply is tight and falling global trust between countries makes that supply effectively even tighter since the smooth distribution of that supply globally is in question. And finally, Lynn's conclusion, she says, so I think the Fed will probably get some signals to stop tightening monetary policy prior to hitting very high levels once something in the financial markets breaks. And I think that will happen before they reach 3% short-term interest rates and or before $1 trillion is off the balance sheet, but we'll see. That last comment has to do with quantitative tightening. Right now, it's $47.5 billion per month, expected to go up to $95 billion after three months. Real quick, in 2022, I'll be honest, if you spend even a moderate amount of time on the internet, it could be wise to at least consider a VPN, which is why I've linked up with Surfshark, the sponsor of today's video. A VPN makes your internet browsing private, it hides your IP address, and it ensures that your internet service provider does not track you. Not only will Surfshark encrypt all of your sensitive personal data protecting it from hackers, but it has a host of other features beyond just providing peace of mind from nefarious actors. You'll like this one. Surfshark's clean web feature will block ads, trackers, malware, and phishing attempts. Surfshark also provides the ability to
to make your IP address look like it's coming from a different country so you can stream video from locations around the world. Surfshark is also one of the only VPNs to allow one account on an unlimited number of devices, a key feature at the Loomis household. And no worries, the user interface is as easy as it gets. It could not be any more straightforward. You can use my code electrified to get 83% off and three extra months free. Surfshark also offers a 30 day money back guarantee. So there is no risk to try it for yourself. The link is in the description below. And remember what Lynn said about how globally trust is low and many countries are doing what they can to vertically integrate themselves to de-risk essentially some of that global macro risk. Well, to that point, I think what Tesla is doing in Canada is definitely going overlooked. Over just the last few weeks, we saw Tesla hire a critical mineral supply chain policy associate in Toronto, and we had the Tesla and Vale deal for nickel. And yes, this is all suggesting that Canada is about to play a greater role in Tesla's global supply chain. Let's not forget in 2019, Tesla buys high bar systems in Canada, and then they just recently changed the name to Tesla Toronto Automation. High bar was considered the leading battery equipment maker in the world, and Elon later said high bar's technology would play an essential role in Tesla's network of gigafactories. Just last year in November, Tesla opened its first branded Ontario factory in Markham, where it's making the battery equipment based on high bar's tech that will end up in Giga Texas and Berlin. And we know about Tesla's relationship with the battery legend, Jeff Don. Novonix was originally spun out of the Don lab by a student, Chris Burns. Burns also used to work at Tesla. Both him and Novonix have been a critical testing partner in Tesla's battery R&D in Canada. And Chris Burns said, the last few years have revealed the significant potential risks of our country's reliance on Asian markets for batteries and battery materials. And what is this? Tesla lobbying? With new money coming into the sectors that Tesla is primarily interested in, adding an additional lobbyist and policy expert is a logical move. In BC and Ontario, Tesla's lobbyist registry documents seem to indicate this is the company's next area of vigorous advocacy. Let's not forget about Tesla Energy. Tesla has been exploring microgrids and is currently operating several large-scale energy storage pilots and projects across Canada, with the largest installed in Alberta, while several more discrete pilots are underway in Ontario in various multi-unit residential buildings and schools. So why is Tesla making these moves? Yes, it's geographically close, which is important, but the Canadian government is serious. The resources are there. We just need the capex, the money to flow into the space to help get the mining and processing started and to have the regulations and incentives properly aligned. The president of the Canadian Vehicle Manufacturers Association said, we have challenges attracting investment into developing those resources and not just mining them, but actually processing them because that's where a lot of the value add is, talking about battery raw materials. This new budget, however, addresses that gap by allocating over $3.8 billion over eight years to implement a critical mineral strategy. So to all of you out there that do fear Tesla's reliance on China, you should absolutely be rooting for Tesla to continually expand on all fronts in Canada as it has started to do. Moving on, Kathy Wood and ARK have sold some Tesla. They do this all the time. They have portfolio limitations, all of that. However, they just bought GM for the first time. Everybody is up in arms wondering why they did this. For me, I think it's a pretty simple play. It seems to be an autonomous vehicle purchase. ARK bought around 158,000 GM shares for about $6 million. So this is only going to be 0.5% of the autonomous tech and robotics ETF. And how would this be an autonomous play for ARK Invest? Don't forget, GM now owns an 80% stake in Cruise. Now, don't get all crazy out there. I'm not saying I support this or I like this move. I'm just explaining what I think is going on and no, I personally have no interest in investing in GM. That said, GM shares are about 44% off of their local highs. And when you take a look at Cruise, this is a very serious investment for GM. GM looking to pour an additional $2 billion into Cruise just this year in 2022. In the first quarter of this year, Cruise incurred losses of $325 million. However, Cruise is aiming to operate across all of San Francisco 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the near future, Currently being reported, it's covering about 70% of San Francisco. And after GM bought out SoftBank's equity ownership in Cruise, as I said, that bumped GM's equity ownership to 80%. And GM just said in its earnings report that these test vehicles will be capable of traveling on 100% of 
San Francisco roads by the end of 2022. And don't forget, the Cruise Origin Robotaxi, which debuted in 2020, will enter production at Factory Zero later this year. As I mentioned, not an investment I personally would make. However, if Cruise can start building these Origins and even breaking even, let alone turn a profit, I can guarantee you the market will receive that very favorably. And we know how incredibly bullish ARK Invest is when it comes to the future of autonomy. Here we have more comments from VW's Herbert Deese being surprisingly honest when he's talking about Tesla. VW faces a tough road ahead to reach its self-imposed target of becoming the world's largest seller of EVs by 2025, effectively admitting rival Tesla was stronger than expected. Deese said, it'll be a tight race, but we will not give up on it. I have to say, we did not expect our main US competitor to be so fast and well prepared. Deese did say, however, he still sees a chance that VW could manage to overtake Tesla and become the world's number one by 2025, pointing to its bigger product offering covering luxury and premium cars as well as volume brands. And I'd imagine Deese has to be referring to VW Group and not just VW brands, as these are the figures for strictly the VW brands in 2021, 369,000 and EVs, including both full battery electric and plug-in hybrid. Why do I think that? Because the goal for the VW brand itself was to hit 1 million EVs annually by 2025, something Tesla almost did last year. Speaking of Tesla China, so far today the market is digesting this news that April was effectively a dud of a month, as Tesla only sold 1,512 cars for the month, exporting zero and producing just over 10,700. So look, it's definitely unfortunate that Tesla's going to lose over 60,000 vehicles sold for the month due to the COVID shutdowns. It was closed through April 19th, 22 days in total. Doing the math, that means Giga Shanghai was only open for 11 days in April, operating well below full capacity due to supplier constraints. So taking the production figure, dividing it by the 11 days, that's around 978 units produced per day and 151 cars sold per day. A small silver lining for May, Tesla has now added over 9,000 units of capacity to be sold in May or the following months. But as mentioned, most of this downside was already priced into the stock. And today we have a very mixed reporting on what's going going on at the factory today. Reuters saying Tesla has halted most of its production at its Shanghai plant due to problems securing parts. Adding Tesla planned to manufacture fewer than 200 vehicles at its factory in the city on Tuesday. Two people familiar with Tesla's operations said earlier that the Shanghai plant suspended work on Monday after it had faced difficulties procuring supplies. This after we just heard that Tesla was aiming to increase output at the plant to 2,600 cars a day as soon as next week. But then we have this from Bloomberg, a spokesman for Tesla has denied the halt that Reuters is reporting on. A spokesperson for Tesla's operations in China said the US car maker is having some issues with logistics and that Reuters report had prompted Tesla to say it had received no notice the factory had ceased to operate and that some cars were still being made there. As remember, as far as we know, it's still that closed loop system. So the employees are essentially stuck at the factory. The issue is if they don't have certain parts from certain suppliers that aren't yet operating at full capacity, there's not much they can do. And this unfortunate month for Tesla comes amid a 35.7% slide in overall passenger car sales in China, the biggest plunge in two years. It's also good to know that Tesla workers in Shanghai were working three shifts covering 24 hours, seven days a week before all of these lockdowns. The workers now in the closed loop system have been doing 12 hour shifts, six days a week. And while workshops at the EV Makers China plant were operating on Tuesday, the situation is fluid and logistics problems may force production to cease entirely later this week. And look, I know a lot of you want me to say it, so I'm gonna say it. I think this zero tolerance policy is a joke. Most of the rest of the world has moved on. Most of these cases are not that serious and it's just something that Tesla is going to have to deal with for however long. A quick note on this Oklahoma bill that keeps moving along, passing the committees. It's not official or anything yet. It still needs to be voted on. However, let's not forget about this. When Tesla built its first store on tribal land, avoiding these state car laws altogether. So there is some precedence for Tesla to work around this if they have to. Tesla opened up a store and repair shop on Native American land for the first time, this back toward the end of last year. This one sits in Nambi, Pueblo, north of Santa Fe on tribal land that's not subject to state laws. Most importantly though, speaking of Oklahoma, these states have lots of sovereign Native American nations in them that could be interested in Tesla. I don't believe at all this will be the last, this coming from Tesla Owners Club of New Mexico. 
We got another note from Morgan Stanley and look at what they said. Nobody wants a lithium or copper mine in their backyard, but with the vast majority of battery metals and upstream processes, refining and all of that done on the other side of the world, US companies and policymakers are re-examining the rulebook around what is done within our borders or closer to home. This is squarely in line with the Tesla Canada theme that we just talked about and look at what I found. The Northwest Territory is an area in Canada with proven public support for the mining sector. Eight in 10 residents felt positively about mining and exploration. A Northwest Territories minister said, our supportive populace is one of many unique propositions we can offer companies looking to invest. Tesla in Canada. Here we have another recall that's really just an over the air update, but it's due to an overheating issue that may cause the center touchscreen display to malfunction. The CPU overheating could prevent the center screen from displaying images from the rear view camera, warning lights, and other information. And as if we needed this drumbeat to become any louder, Stellantis CEO Carlos Tavares is warning about a future battery shortage and everyone's reliance on Asia. He said, we can anticipate that we will have around 25 or 26 a short supply of batteries. And if there is no short supply of batteries, then there will be a significant dependence of the Western world vis-a-vis -vis Asia. And for this last comment, remember what JB Straubel said about all of these legacy automakers making all of these big promises. Have they actually done the math to figure out the raw material supply chain? Stellantis plans to have 400 gigawatt hours of total capacity on two continents by 2030. That's great in theory, but what will they do to make this happen? It's not going to develop itself. Don't forget to check out Surfshark and get 83% off and three extra months free, linked below. Please take a second to like the video if you did. Hope you guys have a wonderful day and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.